the way, you be in prayer for, uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, you be in prayer for Giovanni. He's supposed to be coming this Sunday to follow the Lord in baptism. And uh, don't, my goodness, I'm, that blesses my heart uh, that uh, um, we, when we got to talking about all of those things, he was just like, man, he said, that's what I want to do. I want to I follow the Lord. And uh, boy, what I rejoice in that. <clears throat> Ruth chapter 3, and I'm going to ask if you would to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Amen. Ruth. Amen. Ruth chapter 3. Boy, it's been a little while since we've been in here, hadn't it? Ruth chapter 3, and uh, we'll see where we go. Verse number 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. Thank you, God, for your faithful people that have come here this evening. I pray, God, that you would touch our hearts. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that we would see you, uh, our wonderful and blessed Redeemer. Thank you, God, for loving us even though we are nothing. Thank you, Lord, uh, for loving us even though we have been outside of the realm of your goodness. And yet your love has brought us in and included us. Thank you, God, for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. As we get in here, we're reminded of a few things just by way of reminding you where we have been thus far. We have seen uh, Boaz begin his winnowing ministry uh, there at, at his place. That winnowing was done after the harvest. It was done uh, after the gleaning. Not much to do now. Winnowing happened normally in the evening uh, when that wind would come off of the sea and they would take that grain and they would throw it up by way of some kind of material. There'd be people on the corners and they would throw it up. And that wind would come by, catch the chaff uh, and the husks of that thing while the grain, being heavier, would fall back down. Don't you know that God wants pure seed? Amen. And uh, those things that are in you that are unpleasing, God is trying to work on you and get rid of you, those things in your life. How many of you can look at your life and say, yes, pastor, I realize that God's still working on me. Would you say that? I know that God is still working on me. Not every bit of the chaff is gone, uh, and I mean from my life. Um, I, 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 I would be the first to openly admit that I have not yet arrived. I would be the first to admit that I am not perfect. I would be the first to admit that I'm not all that I can be. I'm not all that I should be. I'm just glad I'm not what I used to be. Amen. And uh, nonetheless, we see that God is working in these things. As a matter of fact, we're reminded of some of that in Psalm chapter 1. Because he say, he talks about the chaff that would be driven away with the wind. We're also reminded of that, that even Jesus mentioned that in the book of Matthew. And he said, uh, where it talks about that he carries his fan with him. 
Let me tell you something. Uh, when Jesus shows up, you need to know that the Holy Ghost is moving. Uh, that fan in his hand, that picture of the Holy Spirit. I love it when God starts fanning. I love it when the wind starts blowing. I love it when I can feel the breeze. Amen. I love it when God is moving. And I do want to mention a couple things to jog your memory. We do, and by, I, I, am, I don't know as you read this story if you're amazed by anything, but there are some things that amaze me in this book of Ruth. But some of these things amaze me in Ruth chapter 3. They really do. I tell you what, Brother Dave, if you can increase my volume a little bit, and it may not be for everybody else, it may just be for me. My voice is a little bit weak tonight, all right? I can just feel it. I feel like I'm working twice as hard for some reason, all right? And, uh, but uh, as we're, we're reminded here in, uh, in Ruth chapter 3, uh, where he says there in verse number, uh, Naomi says in verse number 2, And now is not Boaz of our kindred. She knew the manner of family. She knew where he came from. By the way, do you remember where you came from? Amen. Aren't you glad that God pulled you out of that place? Aren't you glad Psalm 42 and 3, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He had put a new song in my mouth, even praising to our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. i tell you one thing though about Ruth chapter 3. I am amazed at how much Naomi knew about Boaz. They weren't on good speaking terms. She just said, ah, matter of fact, I'd like to remind you, I know she hadn't seen him in at least 10 years. She just said, he's of our kindred. But she said, now let me tell you what he's going to do. I got a question. How well do you know your Jesus? How well do you know your Jesus? Naomi said, man, I'd, I'd tell you everything about him. I can tell you what he, uh, I can tell you what he looks like. I can tell you who he's related to. I can tell you what you need to wear if you're going to find him, if you're going to catch his eye, if you're going to catch his attention. If you remember, she said, I know he's going to want something pure. Uh, she said, I know he's going to want something perfumed. She said, I know he's going to want something pretty. She said, listen, I know the manner all about him as a matter of fact there in verse number 4 she said if you're going to catch him you better keep your eyes on him did you read that there in verse number 4 and it shall be when he lied down now how did she know this was going to happen how did she know he was going to take that time? How did she know he wasn't going to go back into the house? How did she know he was going to sit, lay down and, and find a place of rest? Hey, you ought to start knowing Jesus a little bit better than you do. The closer you get to him, the more intimate your knowledge is going to be of him. Praise God. Watch the man. She said there in verse number four, and it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place. You better keep your eyes on him. Quit getting all messed up with everything and everybody else. This is her telling him, uh, or this is uh, Naomi telling Ruth, you better listen, you better worship him. She said, and by the way, when, you, when he does do that, you go in there and you uncover his feet. You lay yourself down, by the way. Isn't that the way? Isn't that the best way of getting close to him is going down? Isn't that the best way of getting close to him is humbling yourself? Isn't that the best way of getting close to him is saying, God, I'm not worthy, but I know that you're worthy. God, I beg you, God, have mercy on me. Oh, yes. She told him, you start worshiping him. You start loving him. And she said, then you're going to find out you're going to be covered by his glory work because you're covered by his glory work. Come on now. Somebody say amen. Uh, we have that picture because she laid crossways at his feet, giving that symbol of the cross Woo! Hey, don't ever lose sight of Calvary. Don't ever forget what Jesus has done for you. Don't ever forget the way and the time and, the, and what he's done to bring you unto himself. 
praise God. But now, if we're going to look at a couple verses yet again. And I want you to know this. I want you to write this down. That she knew the manner of the fellow. I want to read verse 4, but then we're going to read verses 6 and 7 together too. And it shall be when he lieth down, thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. By the way, if you remember, the last time we were in here, we, we mentioned to you how that every servant had the right to be covered uh, to, to be covered by that which covered the master. That's why she was able to do that. Thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. Look at verse number 6. And she went down under the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. You know, God really is not that hard to understand. Is everybody all right? Boy, if I just knew what God was thinking, really? You don't know what God's thinking? I mean, I want you to really, I want you to really contemplate that statement. You don't know what God's thinking. I understand that God is immense. I understand that God is infinite. I understand He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. I understand that His ways are above our ways. I understand that His thoughts are above our thoughts. But really, you don't know what His thoughts are centered upon. His thoughts are centered upon the field. His thoughts are centered upon His house. His thoughts are centered upon the fruit his thoughts are centered upon you his thoughts are only upon you and the ministry that he has to the world it's not that hard to understand it's not like God in all of this is trying to be unknown God has given us all this so that you can know He's not trying. There are many things that are mysteries, but that in itself is not a mystery of God. God loves you. God loves sinful man. God loved him so much that he died for him. What's so hard to understand about that? This is the problem, though, with the people that spoke to Paul on Mars Hill. And even Paul said that I may know him and the power of his suffering. Let me tell you something, God wants you to know him. The book of Psalms says it like this, be still and know that I am God. I want to show you a few things here. Go back if you would to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2, I've already mentioned these things to you, I just want you to see them for yourself. Ruth chapter 2, and look if you would at verse number 4. <clears throat> We see, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and as he did, this is where he was coming, he was coming, and he, he was there at the field, and he said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you, and they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house and said Boaz unto Ruth hearest thou not my daughter go not to glean in another field neither go from hence but abide here fast by my maidens I want you to write these things down and uh, this will be our study for the evening number one he was thrilled with his field he was thrilled with his field. After he came from, the, from Bethlehem, he walked out getting ready to go up to the house. And sure enough, before he did, he began to holler out to those workers. By the way, isn't it something when you're doing the work of God? Doesn't it bless your heart to hear the word of God come deep into your soul? Doesn't it help you to hear the blessings and the salutations of Almighty God while you're out there doing his work? 
Oh, yes, he began to call out. He said, hey, he said, Lord bless you. And they would cry out, the Lord bless thee. Sure enough, he said to his, his unnamed servant here, he said, who's that over there? He knew exactly what was going on in his field. He knew everybody that was out there. Somebody say amen. When a new face showed up, he had already calculated. He had already written it down. He had already noticed. He had already given. And that, that one, his heart. I'm going to tell you right now, God is intensely interested in what is going on in his field. Take your Bibles and learn, uh, t- turn with me to Matthew 13. Keep your place here in Ruth. Okay, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And let's look, if we can, down at verse number 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. Can I get an amen? The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. I just want you to see that the Son of Man has been going out and the Son of Man has been carrying that pure seed of the Word of God and the Son of Man has been faithful and the Son of Man has been sowing and the Son of Man has been giving it out. Where? In the field that he's been working. He's been working and laboring in the field and the field field is the world. You need to know, friend, that God is working the world. You need to know that God's been working in Burkina Faso. Amen. You need to know, amen, that God's been working in Rome, Georgia. Amen. You need to know that God's been working down in Columbus, Georgia. You need to know that God's working in Jamaica. You need to know that God is working in every field that we're supporting. That God is doing the work and God is intensely interested in what's happening out there in his fields. Hmm. Let's go back if we can to Ruth chapter 3. Not only do we see that he is thrilled with his field, I'm going to point something else out to you here if we can. Ruth chapter 3 and look if you would at verse 6. It says there, matter of fact, Look at verse number three. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known. Verse six, and she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. The second thing we see that he is thrilled with his floor. Have you thought about all the things that are going on on the floor? What is the floor? Uh, Let me just go ahead and give it to you. That's the place (laughs) that God enjoys seeing the fruit of his work. I don't know if you caught or not, but Sunday we had some people that we hadn't seen in a little while as far as people that had recently gotten saved. Come on now. I don't know about you, but that blessed my heart. I've been praying for them. I've been praying, God, I, I don't know where they're at. God, would you bring them back? And my goodness, it blessed and touched my heart to see them here on Sunday. I, I, that's answered prayer for me. I'm telling you, though, that God is thrilled with the floor. This is the place that God is, uh, comes to see the fruit of his work. This is the place of his prophet. God is interested in what is going on in his house. Amen. Let me tell you something, everything that's happening, it doesn't matter if we're having an altar call. It doesn't matter like a, a tonight when we were all came down here and we offered to God our prayer requests and we were lifting up people. We're lifting up Miss Carol and Brother Bud and we're lifting up Cindy and we're lifting up uh, Miss Judy and uh, we're lifting up uh, the, the, those friends of, of Miss Judy uh, Wood and, and we're lifting up so many others that are struggling physically and we're lifting up everybody that's on our prayer list and let me tell you God is interested in that but you also need to know that God's interested in the Giovannis that just come at the end of an afternoon service we wouldn't you realize that only could be done in the mind of God we wouldn't have been here any other time 
and he thought he was looking for God. He had no idea that God was looking for him. You want to know where God found him? Miss Mary, God found him in his floor. God found him right here where he's working. Let me tell you something. God's working on you. God's working on you tonight. God hadn't forgotten about you and where you're at and what you're doing. He's not forgotten about your situation. He's not forgotten about your struggles. He's not forgotten about anything that's happening in your life. What's he doing? He's interested in what's going on in the floor. What's the floor? That's the place that's going to contain all of his fruit. Mmm. By the way, God's still working on you. You ever heard that song? He's still working on me. Make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, Jupiter and Mars. Let me tell you, God cares about you. And God's working on you. And God's developing you. And God's teaching you. And God's trying to hammer you. God's trying to form you. God's trying to press you. God's trying to teach you. God's trying to help you. If you would listen and give in to him and his will for your life. There ain't no other way. And sure, it's not always easy. But it's always best. It's always best. Amen. By the way, I tell you this. I just, I just want to say it blesses my heart to know when my Boaz comes down in this floor. And when our Boaz comes into this floor, you can feel it. Come on now. You can feel it. You know that things are different. By the way, <laughs> They would come in and they would stay in their floor. One of the reasons why was to keep uh, the thieves away. Because if there was no one there, that um, there, if there was no one there, the thieves could come in easily, and they could just even if they didn't get it all, they could take quite a bit of it before anybody would ever, anybody would even know what was going on. You say, well, why couldn't he hire somebody to do it? Well, that's easy. Because nobody cared about it like he did. <laughs> you know, it's interesting about the Great Wall of China. Biggest man-made structure in the world. You know, that thing has only been breached a few times. You all know what happened? They didn't really breach it. Somebody opened the gate. I'm going to tell you something. You need to know that the reason why God is interested with what's happening here is because it's his. And there's nobody that cares about it like he does. But to think to come into church like this is all our thing and it's not God's thing, that breathes rebellion into his face. It hurts the, the heart and the mind of God. And I'm here to tell you, there ain't nobody cares about it like he does. God has a vested interest what's going on here even right now even when the preacher turns red in the face and is hollering and is spitting and all that kind of stuff he's intensely interested in what's happening here he's very interested in the state of your heart He's very interested, not just not just as to whether or not you're attentive but he's more interested in your attitude. Come on now, is everybody with me? What's your attitude toward the Lord? What's your motives toward the Lord? What's your ministry? By the way, I hope you didn't come just to minister to one another tonight. I hope you came to minister to the Lord. You realize that's Bible, by the way. And in ministering to him, we do minister to others. But my ministry is to him. Not only do we see that we've got a master that's thrilled with his field. We've got a master that's thrilled with his floor. There's one more thing he's interested in. We have a master that's thrilled with his fruit. Look at what it says here. Go back to Ruth chapter 3. Look if you would at verse number 6. Verse number 7. 
And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. <laughs> By the way, isn't that a beautiful picture? I love that. It's a, I don't know. That wouldn't be my first choice to go and lay down. Uh, I'd be looking for something a little bit softer. But I'm going to tell you right now, he's very interested in the fruit that he's been bringing in. Matter of fact, I'll even go so far as to say this. That's where he wants to rest. I hope you get in the picture here. I said that's where he wants to rest. That's where he wants to be in full repose. That's where he just wants to lay down, throw his hands back, get himself immersed in the fruit of his own field, enjoy the feel of the fruit amongst himself. Such peace, such joy, such hope, such wonder. Because that is what he has been laboring for. That's what he's been ministering for. That's what his heart has been set upon. Matter of fact, let's look at this very quickly. This is what was going on. The Bible tells us that it was the time of barley harvest. You see, I tell you, this tells me a few things. I want you to write some of this down. Number one, it tells me about the determination of the seasons. You realize that God will bring seasons into your life? Amen. Matter of fact, the Bible said, turn to, turn to Psalm 1 if you would. While you're turning there, I want to give you this. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Say, this is your season. This is your chance. Not everybody has the same chance. Everybody might have a season, but everybody's season is not the same. Let me tell you something. In other words, right now is not the time to be going outside and be looking for strawberries. Everybody all right? Good luck with that one. You might find them up in Alaska or something, but you ain't finding any around here. Not anything that's growing. Somebody help me. Amen. Everything has a season. Look, if you would, at Psalm 1. Uh, Blesses the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. God has a season for you. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. One thing that I've noticed over this past year and three months or whatever that I've been here is that we do have seasons here. I'm not talking about outside. I'm talking about our church. Our church has seasons. There's seasons that our church is going through. There's going to be seasons where our church is more centered on growing. There's seasons where our church is more centered on plowing. Sorry. There's, center, there's seasons that our church is more centered on sowing. There's seasons that our church is more centered on fruit. Why? Because everything is in a season. Matter of fact, when God created the earth and then as even after the flood, God said that all of the seasons that they would not cease. And you need to know that God has a season. What season are you in right now? Something, isn't it, how when you start looking back on your life, what season are you struggling with right now in your life? By the way, a lot of times every season can be a struggle. Well, let me just say it like this. Every season requires work. Just requires work. Doesn't come easy, does it? But yet it's something that is necessary. How about this? Not only do we see the determination of seasons, but how about this? I'm hate to use this terminology, turn to Luke 13. I want you to see this, the dung of his soft-heartedness. Luke 13, look at this. Luke 13. Luke 13. 
Luke 13, if you look if you would please down at verse number 8. Well, let's, let's start reading in verse number 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after thou shalt cut it down. Down. Let me just say it like this because <laughs> there's things that God is going to do in your life to make you bear fruit. And I'm not trying to be inappropriate. I'm just trying to be Bible. But I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people in my life and they, and they in, a, in a very inappropriate way, they'll say, Pastor, I'm just dealing with a lot of stuff in my life. Why do you think that is? Could it be, could it be that God is being merciful to you to cause you to bear fruit? I don't know. I'm just got to deal with a whole lot of mess. Excuse me. Sounds to me like he's been dealing a whole lot with your mess and he's trying to make you bring forth fruit. I just don't like where I'm at. I'm just, everything I have is just stinky. Hmm. All I know is this. You ought to thank God for the mercy of his life, or the mercy of, of his heart, how that he is extending to you one last opportunity to bear fruit. This is your chance. You better get it right. It's a funny thing. Matter of fact, turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse number 8. Well, verse number 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but what? Dung, that I may what? Win Christ. All that mess you're dealing with in your life, it ought to bring forth a fruit. And it ought to bring forth the point where <laughs> you are going to win him. Come on now, is everybody all right? There's a whole lot of people though, they're not about that anymore, are they? God bringing that dung in your life is important to you. It's not to be mean to you. He's having mercy on you. Because for all practical purposes, you should have been cut down and thrown away a long time ago. But God says, watch this. If I bring this in his life, he'll bring forth fruit. <laughs> Let's go back. Not only do we see mm, the determination of the seasons, the dung of his soft-heartedness. Look at this one. How about this? The development of the seed. John 4, 35, you don't have to turn there. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Whew. My, my, my. This is part of God being thrilled with the fruit of his field. He said, man, by the way, here, here's, a, here's the thing. A lot of times we get to looking out at the field. We say, oh, my goodness, nothing's ready. Nothing's coming in. It's all dead. Jesus says, I don't know what you're looking at. Because when I look out here, my goodness, all I see are fields that are white, all ready to harvest. That sounds like someone that's thrilled with what's happening in his field. We'll be done here shortly. How about this one? How about the discipleship of his produce? Look at this. John 15. Turn to it quickly. John 15. John 15.
Because God is trying to help you produce in your life. You know, there's a whole lot of people, they're not producing nothing. As a matter of fact, well, we'll get to that here in just a moment. No, we're not. Yet. Let's look at this. Look at this. Verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye what? Bear what? Much fruit. So shall ye be what? My disciples. Look at verse number 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go forth, and, that you should go and bring forth what? Fruit. And that your fruit should what? Remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're almost done. Let's look at this here. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. A lot of times we turn down to verse number 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Uh, before we do that, can we back up just a few verses here? Look, if you would, uh, here at verse number 18. But if he be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh <laughs> are these, are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, mur uh, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something, there's a whole lot of people. By the way, you're bearing fruit to something tonight. And either you're going to be living according to the flesh or you're going to be living according to the spirit. Which is it going to be? I'm just going to tell you right now, God's interested in his fruit. And the fruit of the flesh is not his fruit. It's the fruit of the spirit that's his fruit. Verse number 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, what are you thrilling him with? Are you killing him with the works of the flesh or are you thrilling him with the works of the spirit? Because I'm going to tell you right now, the thing that thrills our kinsman redeemer are three things. His field, his floor, and his fruit. And the last thing that we saw here about his fruit was something important. And it's called discipleship and growing and manifesting what he's done in our lives and teaching it to others. Because I'm going to tell you right now, God's desire is to, is to glean fruit from your life for his glory. It's pretty simple, isn't it? That's all about a redeemer. Boy, he's excited. And he loves it when you're bearing fruit. We'll have our musicians come. But what kind of fruit are you bearing? Have you disappointed him? By the way, let me just say it like this. We've all disappointed him in one way or another, haven't we? Every one of us. And aren't you glad for that mercy? Aren't you glad that he gives you another chance? By the way, I know we didn't have Sunday school last week, but I hope you'll come to Sunday school this Sunday. You need to be here. You need Sunday school. You need the teaching. You want to know why? Because it'll help you bring forth fruit. It will. It's part of the ministry of God's work. It's part of the gift of God's church is to teach the word. You come, and it'll help you grow. Let's all stand, Lord God, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, God, that you would help us tonight, that you would speak to our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that this church would be a place that thrills you. I pray this floor would excite you. I pray that these here, that you've been winnowing, 
that you've been beating. That you've been tearing off and pulling off the chaff that's resting in our life. I pray, God, that you would be thrilled with the fruit of our lives that we would bring glory unto you. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. As they sing and play, you come tonight. Would you let God have his way? Don't wait. God spoke to your heart. You come. Come on. Come on. You obey the Lord tonight.